uh, we're going to continue our uh, series in this uh, academic uh, seminar. So today we're going to talk about the system optimization and the guys like that. If you have any questions from the uh, last two sessions, I mean, uh, I'll stop and uh, entertain that first, but otherwise uh, we'll go into the next session. Uh, first year, 
and that mission really never operated. And when we needed a plant for our demonstrations in uh, 93, we brought that machine here. But that was not meant designed for any of the loads we have in our hand house, but that's a machine available with the characteristics we said we can live with it. So we'll go into that type of, when you have it stuck with a system which is available because of it cost, then you have to meet your loads and how we operate as an optimum. So the challenge for ours is to envision, this. when you're designing from ground zero, you need to keep this in mind. You want to envision a cycle, concentration, optimization goals using real components uh, and capable of operating close to maximum efficiency, varying from minimum to maximum capacity, both in refrigeration and fraction one. That means you're trying to cover the whole globe and trying to do what it is. But if you do it at the initial steady level, what it does is uh, uh, when you do it on the paper at the steady level, it basically points out what can be the limiting factor. If that is not a lot of cost and water in it, we have the option to make the component big enough so that it won't become the bottleneck, even if the thing change. So those are the factors, what you want to think about it during the study phase. So what, what I'm trying to get at it is, don't just center around the, the your one goal you have for one operating point in specifying the system. So that's one of the key parameters I want to emphasize here, so that people think about it. If you are going to put this much power, say your design capacity, let's say CHR, we need 4.6 kilowatts at uh, 2 kilowatts. So it comes with certain amount of carnal work, uh, so much in terms of the compressor power and whole ball size. So what we should envision at that time is to make sure that machine is also doing the 2K. If it happened to be we need a 4K, is it producing all the capacity it can produce as a 4K or something, some silly valve or a silly pipe limiting it or something. I mean, which will, if we don't go through all the modes, you won't recognize what a simple small thing can restrict it. And I'll go over the exam, real life examples where we got caught ourselves in those columns. And when we want to optimize it, what are we trying to optimize uh, when we say optimization? See, we're taking the low pressure flow and other medium flow and compressing to the high pressure. Basically, the energy level, uh, thermal energy level at the 300 K at the room temperature level is very close to equal. All we did is we took this, which is a entropy, high entropy, and we compress it to the low entropy. We are cooling it to bring the entropy lower and lower to make it useful uh, form of the fluid. So in doing that, we can optimize this to produce the capacity given here in many forms. One is we can increase the mass flow through the system. So for a given mass flow, I mean, if we have, say, for 100 grams, we have, say, one kilowatt here, by doubling the flow, we can double that. That's one way to increase the capacity. The other way is to increase the capacity is raise the pressure ratios. Uh, the other way to raise it is increase the refrigeration steps you use. So there are various combinations playing to increasing the capacity of the system. But what are these combinations? How do they put together will play into an optimum system so that given the goals like what we said at the upfront, minimum cost, maximum efficiency, maximum reliability, I mean, things like that. Whatever you have as a project goal, make sure that kept in mind and look at the parameters, what are independent, and how do you optimize so that we are able to preserve your optimization goals. Uh, going back, I started in this business, uh, initially at the time, we used to be very concerned and very afraid of the cold parts you uh, used in the cold box because they used to leak, they used to create a uh, lot of uh, maintenance issues. So our optimization in the 70s and 80s was to minimize the cold and parts cold. So if we go back and look at it, most of the plants built were with a lot of compressor because to minimize the amount of cold components used, turbines or whatever. So the optimization varied with the time as well as we learned more about it and we were able to build more reliable components like the wet trends and all like that. Say, uh, like I said, uh, Sam Collins, when he introduced the uh, Collins liquefied in the uh, 60s, uh, actually 40s, late 40s, uh, after the Second World War, 
most of the plans were built uh, were based on that optimization of minimizing the four parts. That's why it has two expanders. So when I came around and asked the question when I joined uh, CTI, I said, hey, why do we have an all these machine two expanders? Oh, that's our tradition, that's what we do. But there was nobody who started kind of Sam, how he thought about it. We lost already a lot of continuity from people to people passing the, uh, this information. And I really never gotten a real answer how that ended up because when I studied thermodynamics, it didn't add up in my mind, that's the optimum. But there was an optimum in somebody's mind on a, some parameter. So what I'm trying to say is when we judge and say, oh, this is, not, this is dumb, it may not be dumb at the time it was built. It has a different coordinates of optimization of different races. So we should be very careful in passing treatment on old things because the priorities and the goals of available things might have been so different. And also as along the way when we introduced the turbo machines, uh, they were not, I remember we had uh, four, four boxes built, uh, three, I mean, 1500 watt machines. And there were 15 turbo, uh, I mean, turbo expanders first time used. Out of 15, I think uh, four, uh, 13 or 14 failed, first go around. At that time, Salsa was the, our rep. We built that our CDI. And uh, we didn't know, I mean, they didn't know either uh, what was going wrong, and we were introducing uh, these components. But now, if you look at the turbo expanders, we started the CHL probably uh, it's almost approaching 20 years. Uh, and the, still, we have most of the turbines are running from day one. So we, I mean, it came a long way in the last 30 years, a lot of technology. Same thing, we started with resistance compressors. Every six months to less than a year, we used to have a valve well leakage problem, fire carryover problem. So we slowly introduced the screw compressors at the, at like, around late 70s, early 80s. And after we introduced that, and we had oil carryover problem, once we understood that, now our compressor are running 70, 80,000 hours around the clock, Whereas the screw copper manufacturer will tell you around 35 to 40,000 hours, you have to rip it around and maintain, change all the bearings, thrust bearings and everything. And we don't do that. We figured out how to extend the life even beyond what the manufacturers thought. So we, we came a long way in producing a highly reliable components along the way by uh, working with them and understanding their behavior more and more. So, so the majority of the goals uh, can be account. That's another thing. A lot of times we think these are the exclusive, these goals we have to give up one to get the other optimization. And sometimes maybe, but most of the times if you put your thinking up front and, and very seriously if you think about it, most of them can be inclusion. They don't have to be exclusive of each other. And so, first of all, what we have to do is, you know, when you want to come up with a system for a given project, you need to prioritize. What are your priorities in for this project goals? Like, for example, uh, filling CHL2, what's our goal? It has to have the highest reliability. It has to have the high efficiency because the, now we can't afford to run these machines like we used to run in the past uh, and pay the operating bills for it power is becoming scarce and cost of power is going up. And so all those factors what we identified all became very important. So anyone we cannot say not important. And so that's what we did and we'll go into that. And, uh, so the trade-off relationship between the, the first two factors like uh, what I said, uh, The operating cost and capital cost uh, can be, we, we can quantify those two. We, we know at the beginning when we are uh, designing a system, uh, if we increase the heat exchanger size or if we, if we add another carbon step, what's it going to cost to the capital? And same thing. And uh, so if we add that and if we come up with the cycle where it says it's going to reduce it, another megawatt now, we know what the operating cost is. So, we, if, by, on the paper, we can study the influence of trade-off between capital and the, uh, and, and the operating cost. I mean, it's not impossible. They lack in the, in 
in the I mean, 70s and 80s. It used to look like it is impossible. Now we understand well enough. We can do a very fine analysis of uh, and very accurate analysis of these trade-offs. And by saying, okay, is it well worth the investment? Or is it causing more reliability issues? Or is it the capital justified? Things like that. So first is anybody who has been in the field of the experience, you know, for a given load, if we have a 2K, if we have a shale, if we have this kind of loads. What, what is the cycle, kind of from the literature, from looking at it, to put on a TS diagram for the various loads, you can come up with it kind of a sketch of cycle. Then you can go through adding and subtracting these components in various cycles. You can come up with the, uh, using the trade-off analysis, what, what makes the optimal. So we'll go through that, how we did for the 12 job uh, as we go through the cycle, how we apply this in optimization, and how we accomplished it. And same thing with nitrogen. Um, is it uh, worthwhile? That, that, uh, we're going to come into that next week. The next session about nitrogen reloading. But we can make the top heat exchange 380 k large enough to reduce the nitrogen, but there is cost of nitrogen versus the cost of the heat exchange is what you're trading. So you can do that optimization. And that's all given if you look in your book in the appendix G, it goes back and shows you in a cycle uh, where you're given this much this many megawatts into a compressor and how much is going to the useful load, how much is lost in each heat exchange, how much is lost as a inefficiency of the expanders, how much is lost. All this is uh, itemized and given to you in, as an example in the appendix. So by looking at it, you can look at it, okay, if I change this component, if I, say it's going to cost me another 100k more, how long it will, and what is my reduction in power or utilities, and how long it will take. And you can do that on a panel. That's, that's the beauty of where we are now is we can analyze all these things on the paper. And these are all that's what, yeah, this is a basically, so the, in the process industry, we said 4 cents a kilowatt, and it went up now, but that's when I wrote it, that's what it was a few years ago. Uh, say, if it is a 4 cents a kilowatt hour, then um, $1,000 is the capital we used to say to pay back in 3 to 4 years of capital. That's what the industry used to tell me is, hey, I'll give you money if you're going to give me back in 4 years and leave me the, and, and my capital and my plan. So that's how much they're willing to give it. Now, when was it, six months ago? I have a call from Will and also somebody in the DOE to say, forget how long it takes, 15, 20 years, don't even pay. With the green uh, the, uh, greenhouse gases and the, with the thing, first we want to know what's the technically achievable optimum in terms of reduction power. And we're doing that. I mean, you guys are, I mean, it's not that far away saying that this op operational optimization, I mean, cost will be so enormous, both from not only just the power bills in terms of environmental effects and all this, there will be other factors come into picture. That's uh, one of the things I used to say when people used to tell me, you know, the market will set the rule. Market can only set the value of it as long as the value of the commodity addresses what it takes to produce it. Like, for example, my, my example used to be, Okay, you can, uh, oh, well, oil, 100 bucks a barrel. Okay, I'll give you a million dollars, make me a barrel of oil. Not how fast you can dig it out of the ground, but that's not what it is. It took 20 million years to make that barrel of I mean, if you put that 20 million years into the cost of the barrel of oil, what it took nature, then the market will set it, set it straight. Indirectly, we are approaching that now by environmental effects or other things. How we abuse it basically, basically they're catching up to tell us we need to correct our actions and pay attention to uh, how we treat energy and environment. Basically, that's where we are heading. And these things basically tells you where, how to trade off the components to the operating cost. Like I was implying at the beginning, what's the, how do we set the pressure ratio? So, I mean, if we increase the pressure ratio, we know we can pack more availability on the high side. But it comes with a, some kind of a reliability cost, because if we keep pushing the pressure up, a lot of components which rotate, which turn, and the seals and all cannot take the differential pressure between the high pressure and the eventual seal of environment, that as the differential pressure increases, they will start developing more leaks. 
So the sooner or later you will start pay, I mean, getting into the reliability issues if you keep pushing the pressure ratio up. So, of course, you want to use the as high a pressure ratio your reliability allows, and as long as you have the components which are reliably and efficiently work in the train, that's what you want to use for the pressure ratio, highest possible pressure. So that, another thing is, we uh, put it in here, lot of people, although 20 times with is 300 pounds, 150 pound component, they think it's 150, but it's normally used for uh, almost 300 pounds at, at 100 F so. I mean, although the rating and there is a misnomer in terms of how we practice versus how we rate them in ASMA. So you should just make sure you are using technical I mean, literature of when you say 150 pounds components, we normally use it up to 18 atmospheres. That's legally allowed. And 300 pound components up to 50 atmospheres, things like that. Make sure you are taking, you are using the full range of the mission. So uh, another thing is, uh, as we increase the pressure ratio, again, you want to match the uh, compressors and their, and the turbines, their efficiency. Number one is the compressors. See, in the past, uh, we were always uh, uh, more, uh, uh, spent most of our time optimizing the code box. And compressors is one of the things which is highly neglected, although we lose half our input power right at the compressor level before it gets into the core box. And after that, at least half is useful, and half is lost in the core box, and other half goes into the load. But we lose most, two-thirds of our input power is lost at the compressor level in the losses. And it did not get the attention it deserves so far. And that's one of the areas we want to put some time in uh, improving that efficiency and uh, that's <coughs> And similarly, the turbo expanders also have a peak efficiency between a factor of uh, 3 and 5, and the compressors have the between 2 and 4. So when you do the cycles, you want to come up with these cycles where these machines work at their, close to their peak efficiencies. Then the next one is the temperature ratio. So higher the pressure ratio, it provides you higher temperature ratio across the expanders. And also the number of thermal steps. The more the cardinal steps you use to cover from 300K to 4K, the minimum will be the part of a mass flow you need. And so you want to basically also keep this uh, temperature ratio constraint in the, in the picture in optimization. So you are maximizing your cardinal steps so that, like ESR was originally designed as a refrigerator. It did not require as many turbines. So, it was, it can produce a decent 15% uh, carbon efficient refrigerator, but when we go to a liquefied, it's less than 10%, or it takes 150 watts per uh, gram per second versus it should be one gram per second to 100 watts. So the, it doesn't have all the uh, uh, carbon steps or the temperature ratios optimum as a liquefied, because it's not originally envisioned uh, for that application. So. It, you want to make sure when we are building a new machine, in that case it's going to be used for something else, and make sure if you can afford it, make sure the cycle is designed as a balancing cycle. And the next is the mass flow. As we said, we, we can increase the capacity by increasing the compressor proportion to the load. But what do you pay in, if you keep doing that? If you keep increasing it, Heat exchanges are growing, so your cold box is growing, your number of compressors are growing. So everything is proportionally increasing. You're not gaining the efficiency by size increase, size scale with respect to mass flow. Yeah, you can scale it proportionally, but is this the best you can do? So what I'm trying to say is as the size goes up, I mean from one kilowatt to say 10 kilowatt, 4 k machine, you can take advantage of other uh, temperature ratios Somewhere else, you can use them just start paying for the proportionally increased heat exchanger. You can afford to buy another uh, expander stage. So you should go back and look at it, feed back your system capacity and optimization back again to make sure you are optimizing, just not proportionally increasing. One of the things what is happening uh, in general terms in my whole career was 
give me one of those, but scale it to this capacity. And that's normally is not a good idea. Just because you are losing what you can improve, either you went up in capacity or you can reduce in capacity to with respect to your training. So you want to make sure you are real. See, looking on the paper is the least expensive way and the most easy way to plan it. And if we are capable, most of the time these decisions, people try to hide if they don't have the capabilities instead of going and getting the capabilities, make the judgments based on what they can extrapolate. So just scale it from here. So I, I don't think that is the right way of doing the business in the, in the best interest of the project. And uh, when we come to the expander, I um, mean the flow, uh, the turbines have uh, have a fixed nozzle, so they can only process so much flow because it has a given area of open. If it is a reciprocating, you can change the flow capacity with speed. So they they come up with various operating characteristics in terms of the flow coefficients for these uh, between the turbo expanders and reciprocating expanders. You can use with with a fixed nozzle, also with variable speed, you can still take, I mean, they can be also used to optimize over the full range of your varied capacities. They, they should not be treated as a limitation, what I'm trying to say is, although they look like a limitation, if we use properly our thinking, we can ex expand their limitation into usable range in a more efficient way to move our plant over the full range. I mean, like I said, so you can change the capacity of reciprocating by changing the speed. With the turbo expanders, we had, if you want to get more flow through the turbine, we had to raise the pressure, up, reduce the pressure, and it is less sensitive to the temperature because it goes as the square root of the temperature because uh, turbo expander uh, uh, flow works as a choked flow artifice. So, in a balanced cycle, we can incorporate these and still they, they won't be the limiting factors. Then when we come to the next component, the biggest component, we use the heat exchangers. So when we, in the helium systems, we use heat exchangers of very high effectiveness, as high as 98, 99 percent. So in process industry, where we started learning this uh, particular area of specialty, they never pushed the heat exchange components to these high effectivenesses. And initially, at the beginning, of, like I said, at my start of this in the career, we didn't recognize some of these limitations. When we're pushing into 98, we, like we used to take the same process we are using in natural gas, oil, oil and gas processing industry, and we were trying to adopt the, apply the same principles. What we found when we reach these high effective things, we got to pay very high uh, uh, analysis and quality control in defining the distributors, the nozzles, the bond distribution between stacks. Like we have raised heat exchangers with say 20 layers on the high side and 50 layers on the low side, low pressure side. And one layer, all functions, you lose 5% of the effectiveness right there. And that means out of the, you started with 100, you're already at 95. And if they, in the helium business, if it's uh, 98 or uh, 97 is the lowest after that, your capacity will start dropping very quickly. So, whereas if we go to process industry, say if there's a leak or something down, it goes and say, just plug the one pass. You can't afford to do that in helium. What I'm trying to say is, when you go to this high effective, high efficient systems, every simple, small thing becomes a big issue. And you have to pay a lot of attention in designing the flow distributors, the distributor pressure drops, the core pressure drop, and all these things are very, very important. And may not be that important in other industries. So when you push it to these levels, you have to be very careful. Same thing, horizontal versus vertical. See, in a vertical heat exchanger, you we normally put high temperature at the uh, top end and the uh, low, te uh, low temperature at the cold end. So it's uh, hydrogen. Density-wise, it's balanced. If you put a horizontal and the cross-section on each pass from top to, down is, top to low is so high in the helium, 
when you come below 20 Kelvin, they can cross flow. So you, you lose all the effectiveness. So you, you shouldn't use heat exchangers in helium service horizontal unless you have no other way to do it. And if you are using it, make sure your flow distribution characteristics are addressed very carefully with hard fins or high pressure drops or whatever the price you have to pay for the choice you are making. So, say another trade-off relationship is are we, should we use nitrogen or should we use expanders? We'll get into that uh, for the 300 to 80K. We'll do that next time. And uh, <coughs> now, other, other optimization we do is uh, say we want to, uh, we have an existing plan and uh, uh, we want to minimize the investment. So in this regard, when we say uh, minimize the investment, we already said, okay, it's okay to pay more for the operations. That means we know we want to get what we want to get in operating, but we want to maximize. That's what we did say when we run ESR as a, as a liquefier. We know that's not the best place, but that's what we have to do to meet certain loads. So we do that, knowingly we do that because that's the system we got. So things like that, we, we make compromises, but knowing, making those compromises knowingly is okay, but getting into the situation by not thinking about it when you're designing may not be the right thing to do. And another thing uh, we normally run into is the high peak and low average. A good example is our CTF test lab. Uh, the test lab folks come in in the morning and they want to fill all their doors and they go home in the evening and we got the time to take this gas and really go five over the night so we can average it. So we'll have a large tour and we fill it overnight and so So we can, instead of sizing the plant for the peak they're going to draw, so for example, the plant capacity we got is like around four to five grams a second liquefaction. And whereas the, they draw around on the peak level of around almost 15 grams a second. So it's not worthwhile for us to put a 50, three times bigger plant there because the average is meeting it. So how to average it is uh, we have given in appendix B if you look at it. Uh, it's a tool of how we can average, how we can store even a, like a quench energy, like uh, when you have large magnets and when they quench. And to pull back and refill it, you need a very large refrigerator. But if you can absorb that peak in a different way into a door and really to fight over time, that's what we are doing at the sort of provider is to uh, take this uh, big quench energy and take the one atmosphere to is good, two atmosphere in the door. And we have to absorb all this uh, amount of quench energy into the liquid helium in the next four hours that is to drop the re, re, re refrigerate all it and bring it back to the normal. So we don't have the sizes, otherwise the machine has to four times bigger. So it's not worthwhile because on an average it's going to run at, at an average here and to do those peaks you come up with other ways of optimization. So minimum moving parts. This is what we were doing in the 70s and 80s is mainly the reliability of the cold parts were not now uh, comfortable. So we were trying to minimize the number of cold expanders and we were, we were paying the price by putting a more bigger compressor and bigger heat exchanger. So, but nowadays, with the proven components, uh, we, we are not as concerned or as scared as we used to be. And now we are using as many right thermal steps and right cold rotating parts and <coughs> even the compressors and all that. Now we can bring the system's efficiency very close to optimally possible at the component levels that are available. Unfortunately, in helium, very little has been done for the helium state. Most of it is borrowed from either process industry or the refrigeration industry. And because of the small market, we only modified very little and adopted these to our advantage. So there's still a lot of scope in improving these components for the helium purpose.
Yeah, there's a trade off between the maintenance cost, maximum system capacity, and maximum reliability. And it comes between, okay, we have a system. If we keep pushing, like CHL, when we started in the 2K system in 94, we were running as we were told by the manufacturer run at 20 atmospheres, uh, 20.4 or whatever. And our system availability was in the low 70s. I used to, I mean, we used to have the call from MCC all the time saying, cry is down, cry is down. Because we were running what we were told by the manufacturer to run at 20, because that's all we knew. And uh, we were following the guidelines provided to us. Then, as we develop, as we go into the optimized processes, we develop, we do not have to run that. We started lowering below 18 atmospheres. And the availability of failures dropped, and uh, it made a big difference between 18 atmosphere and 20 atmosphere. Because as you keep moving the pressure up another 30 pounds, it's a lot of overload on those already loaded components. <coughs> and another thing, this is the biggest one is, uh, in practice, high efficiency also, and uh, low operating cost is also at the low capital cost. So that is the bottom line. And this is contrary. That's, I mean, it, most of the people fail. The most efficient system is going to cost you a lot more. And that's where, I mean, actually I started working when I became a user from the vendor, is uh, spent my initial time working on that. And where is this trade off? And found to be the most efficient system is, why I say is, the more the efficient the system, you need less compressor. You need smaller heat exchangers, smaller buildings. If you trade in everything into efficiency, you already paid for the increased number of cargo steps by reduced compressors and heat exchangers. So, there is an optimum in terms of how far you can push this efficiency. So, <clears throat> as an example, SLC was, supercolloid was designed to have a wall of hardware around 80%. That's what all the industry recommended. And when I became the user and joined that, and that's what I was, and it didn't add up. And when I questioned it and I said, we should build a 30% carbon, which is possible. And that's when they used to, oh, it's going to cost me, we cannot afford it. That's the first answer. Second answer is, oh, it will be not reliable at all if you push the efficiency to that. And that's where most of this work started developing, and that's when put in effort to understand that and where we prove over the years the most efficient system is also the least cost and also equally reliable. And like I said, historically we borrowed from other things, and there's a lot of scope improve all this and some of the places where we think we need to improve our district. So now come to the basic floating pressure system. This is also called Danny cycle of floating pressure. Basically it's a constant pressure ratio cycle. And what it does is it addresses all the issues what we talked so far. Uh, the traditional cycles are designed specifically for maximum capacity operating point. In actual system, the loads often vary, and the components used in the system may or may not meet what we originally thought on the paper. So those things were never being thought of in the design. We always said, OK, give me this 4 kilowatt machine. But we never thought, our load, we are making an estimate on how, what will be the load in the, our prime modules or the transfer lines. We don't know, actually, although we said 4.6 kilowatts. And that's, and so, as such, for the off design modes, we were forcing the plant to operate at the maximum capacity. That's how the systems we were told by the vendors to say. This is your PS. If you want the most efficiency, make sure you make as many components as close to the PS as possible. Well. So we use the haters to keep more, I mean, if we don't have enough heat, turn on the haters or bypass the compressors. We did everything possible just to keep as many components close to the TS as possible. So what we, when I became the, like I said, user, it didn't add up in my head because when we're designing, I can see the characteristics of the turbines, I can see the uh, uh, heat exchangers, 
every component has a lot more range than fixing at that point. So that's where we spent time trying to understand can, how do we take advantage. That's why we came up with this floating pressure condition and we said basically once we design it, the TS has no place basically because either your components are not the same, are not what you thought, or the loads are not what you thought. So you need to design such that it should be able to operate for a given input power anywhere in that uh, range given what it is. So, so let's take a simple compressor, heat exchanger, turbine and a load system. That's a basic floating pressure system. So what it, what it is, is that uh, both expander and compressor, they both are fixed, uh, fixed displacement machines. So compressor for a given displacement with for a given charge, it establishes suction pressure. And whereas the, for the same mass, the expander, because it has a fixed orifice in the choke flow, then it establishes its inlet pressure. Which is that expander inlet pressure is the compressor discharge pressure. Basically, these two establish the fixed pressure ratio. Once you select a compressor and expander, the pressure ratios are fixed. And only at what level those pressures operate depends on the pressure, the amount of charge we put in. So, so the compressor itself is suction pressure, and the expander, like I said, its suction pressure is the compressor discharge. So these are fixed by the, the capacities of those two. So gas charge establishes what level these pressures are. So essentially, the, this is a constant pressure ratio. The pressure ratio is not varying once these two are the compressor and the expander are selected. And if we, if we can maintain the constant pressure ratio, the efficiency is fixed. Basically, what happens is we can move the same TS diagram across by changing the amount of mass in the cycle. By, by decreasing it, we can move it left. By increasing the mass in the circuit, by moving the left side, we can increase M dot through the loop. M dot is proportional to your load. So we can change the load without affecting the TS diagram. So if we can keep the TS diagram, that means we are maintaining the efficiency. By throttling the heat, we are not maintaining the TS diagram without adding heat or by without throttling. So that is what this floating pressure brings in. So basically, these are how the various components work. If the, if the temperature is falling, that means you don't have enough load. So it sends the, some mass out, it reduces the amount of charge so that it will satisfy it. If the temperature is going up, it will add some mass to add to raise it. So the amount of charge is based on your re return temperature and it automatically just Same thing happens at ESO. People come in and turn on the experiment in the middle of the night and we don't get a call because the charge in the system goes up from 13 atmospheric discharge all the way up to 18 and our capacity of the plant doubles. So, and as the capacity of the plant comes down, it will condense and liquefy some gas and leaves in the door. So we can float without us being there, close to the maximum efficiency, we'll follow the load without wasting any power. And on a TS, if you follow, I guess, the theory behind uh, how the CP versus the constant pressure, basically the isotherms and the the delta S is CPL and PR. If you go back, that's basically the slope is a specific heat of the fluid. For most of the fluid Kelvin, the CP of the this field, the helium is pretty constant. So this almost works like that. And if you follow this, that's you. So and basically what it boils down to is uh, that uh, the pressure ratio is saves. Cloud cycle is a constant pressure uh, pressure cycle. And Stellar cycle is a constant volume. A floating pressure gun cycle is a constant pressure pressure cycle. This is what's the difference between the other cycle. This is basically the pressure ratio is constant because it follows this law. And by following that law, we end up with a constant efficiency for any charge. And all our plants, we vary from 40 to 100 percent. We'll show you some of the plants what we adapted, where this what per what doesn't change, and the efficiency remains constant. So when we go back and say, okay, how were we doing it before? So we were, so if, the, if we had to adjust the load, 
these are the various mechanisms used in the past by throttling. Either we changed the compressor to charge pressure, or we added the, we added the, uh, and this is the floating pressure. We added heat initially. That's more. Ninety percent of the time today, to keep the PS diagram the same, that's what they do. The user turns on the heat. Although it can't really, I mean, I'm sure most of the people it bothers them, but they don't, they don't know what to do. So they feel helpless, and this is the easiest thing they, they can do. They just make up the heat, which is not there, to keep it on the TS. Because they're afraid if they allow it to move away from the TS, they think it's going to violate something. Or some of these control valves in the system are set. I mean, like, for example, at CHO, at all these control valves, when we took it from CBI and the gate, were controlling at the TS, where, because we came from industry and we understand their ranges, we relaxed all those things because we know they have much wider range beyond where they fixed at the TS. So similarly, what, what they did is they brought the inlet valve to the turbine to reduce the capacity because it's getting cold, just by adding the heat. So it bypasses some at the compressor because as you throttle, it cannot process. And I mean, like that, if you go through each thing, how and they act, they bypass at the turbine level. So there are various mechanisms used, but not allowed the leaving the compressor and turbine to leave where they're designed and where is the charge. That's not what people adopted. That's what we did. And what happens in real life is every component has tolerance. Although we specify at one point, it doesn't come across. Either heat exchange, if we say 98% effective, it can be 99 or it can be 95. Once the machine comes here, we're already, it comes two years late and then we are behind schedule. We're going to take what we get, never goes there. And all of us, including me, when I was the end of that, we know that. All we have to do is take it there. Once it is there, it's not coming back. We mess around for a while. They will be happy with uh, living with it. And uh, so we learn that's that's the way that traditionally it works. But we all know. Heat exchanger can be more effective or less effective. Expander can have a uh, more bigger flow coefficient or more efficient or less efficient. See, uh, bigger flow coefficient or less. Compressor volumetric displacement can be higher or lower. Although we pick nominal numbers on our TS when we size it, we know all these have tolerances. They all will be there. So by doing that, they, the TS will move differently if we allow them not constrained. Or we can force it to the black. So what happens is if we by allowing the flow, so if we don't allow the floating pressure, if the if the efficiency is low or if the heat exchanger is smaller, you will not meet the capacity basically and by pushing it to the design point. Uh, if they are more efficient, then you're going to throttle because that's where the TS sets and that's where the turbine inlet valve or compressor set is to bypass. By taking away the controls, basically what we do in floating pressure is we move the controls to protection of the devices, not as a controls for the process. We allow them to move the entire range where they are not destroying themselves. So that way they can float up in pressure and temperature or float down and still cover the range. So if the, com if the components come more efficient than we think, we can meet our design capacity at a uh, more carbon efficiency than originally designed. And if we restrict it, we cannot meet the capacity. That's basically what happens if we follow the fixed. So other cycles are basically like what we said in the past is that our helium liquefact is a stack up of so many shield refrigerators to do that. And, uh, Basically, by using a floating pressure cycle, we can design this whole thing to flow in a different way. And this is basically our license stuff to Lindy. And this is the traditional way these pressures are fixed. And by allowing here, except the load compressor where this is one atmosphere fixed, but these all these pressures flow, and the, the pressure ratios remain <coughs> constant. So these efficiencies always remain constant. So we have 40 to 100 percent of the Load, we have the same watt per watt, wherein we'll go into that uh, with the exam. So, in summary, it provides uh, uh, 
a basis for optimum maximum load and turn down, and, and also provides a solution to inbuilt, I mean, as built systems, which can have different components, either exceed and not came short, mostly come short, very rarely they exceed. And also, until now, people always used to think, oh, DS diagram is the, is the book given to us by the God. So once the manufacturer gives it, the closer we live it, we maintain it, we are doing the best we can, and, and that's another myth we want to dispel. And uh, uh, the, this uh, coating pressure was like, uh, it's a constant pressure ratio cycle instead of the constant pressure on a constant volume process. And it's a variable gas charge. And, and it doesn't, another beauty of it is, all the instrumentation we know, how reliable it is, and we don't depend on it. We let out the turbines, um, and the compressor run at full throttle, and we only use the load return temperature that's adjusted, but we don't worry about top line outlet, top line outlet, compressor ditch. All these things are allowed to, they can have an error, but it doesn't affect efficient operation as closely as a normal system. We're not as tightly tied into instrumentation in a floating pressure as in the case of a traditional system. And when we try to tell this, oh, we have done it. But there's nobody there who can show where they have done it. But what was the argument they used to say? Oh, increase as a system comes with increased capital cost, or reduced availability, high risk to the basic program. That's what the industry said. The users, TS design is the optimum, force the system to TS. You should not change the system operation from the basic design and the operating method. It's given. Cryogenics, not the experiment. Don't mess around. It's the, the guy gave you, the guard gave you, the vendor gave you, and stay out of it. A cryo system is running fine. Don't change it. Scale the new system from an existing one. Repeat the same mistakes. Uh, other thing is, oh, if you go and changing it, now you have to train the operators. Believe me, every, everyone is given to me on one project as a, I heard everyone from the people on different projects. These are not made up. These are what they told me. So this is our uh, licensing agreement of the next one. So how did we use this to? Actually, this is what uh, we did for uh, when we are doing the cycle study for the 12 job. Uh, so, what, what is the purpose? Is lay the ground because first uh, we have to build the civil facilities like buildings, cooling tower. All this has to go out before we have a design. We don't know how big it is, how much power we need. All these things have to be specified way before we design it compresses the core boxes in the heat system. That comes way back, but we have to commit to it. And when we are committing, we also have to make sure we are not committing something which is not optimum from all these aspects of its hazard. Like uh, our present CHL is designed as a liquefier. As a refrigerant, it's not as good as it could have been if we thought about it in the beginning. And our, uh, our and, uh, <coughs> Also, we want to make sure we are not writing these specifications around one single vendor. Then, because these vendors are very capable of understanding how this is developed. And so if we write around any particular way, then they say, OK, it's written around us, and they think they can charge more. So you have to come up with a cycle where you can specify you are covering all your competitive vendors are capable of producing, and at the same time, they are providing the system which meets all your optimization and capacity goals. So that's that's a reason. And also, we want to make sure what we are asking for our buildings and facilities and utilities are covered. We don't want to go over specific. For example, we want to use uh, the new system should be around. Uh, 
we think uh, we'll be running this uh, around 4 megawatts at the full capacity versus 6 plus megawatts at the existing CHR. But we cannot commit, say, that's all we need for our utilities until we know a design on our hand, say, this is how we're going to buy it, otherwise we're going to come short. So that, those are the main reasons why we said we got to do this and, this and to write the specifications also. Like we said, effectively communicate to the vendor, saying that first thing they're going to tell you is not possible. So if you give them a say, hey, this is how it is possible, they can complain or mess around with you too much. So, and use the lessons learned from CHLS, NSX, etc. Compare the present, also make sure how does it compare to other systems out there, some and other systems. So basically, this is CHL1, this is CHL2, very close to the same, except we increase the liquefaction maybe more, so that we can bring the system back online after trip. And this is the, basically the Carmo analysis, which we went through in the last time, in the last class. And this is a cycle analysis uh, of one of the four we looked at it. And this is the analysis of the various things that the heat exchangers, this is the various control volumes, this is the turbines. So this has a summary sheet of, it, it has like 50 sheets, but it's a top summary sheet. And uh, so these are the various cycles we compared and their specialty case when we are presenting this to the job job committee saying that what we did. And uh, these are the various uh, component parameters. And these are the, basically, this is how we compare CBAP1, original design, operating, uh, and SNS to CERN to our cycles. So we basically look and map everything. What is out there? What is published in the design versus operating process? And make sure where these cycles fall. And after we said, okay, it has to be more than 48 percent karma for this, and we match the compressors and the turbines. So this is how we wrote our specification. We said we need to do six modes basically as a maximum capacity, and this is where we expect we're going to run at the 12 job case on a nominal. And this is when we want to run as a liquefier, as a refrigerator. This is when we have to fill after a trip. And this is when we have to maintain at 4K as a maintenance operation when the LINAC need to be at 4K. We have to do maintenance on the system. So this is how various modes the system is going to see. And these are all, we define it up front because it will see maximum refrigeration during pump down. And these are all not looked in the original CHL1, so we have to figure out the path when we're doing commissioning CHL1. It took many, many years to figure out all those things. And because we knew all these things, SNS, we were able to commission in two weeks, and we want to make sure we continue what we learned in this. So the thing is, we designed, although the capacity varies from XRG of 1,300 kilowatts, XRG all the way down to 300, 400, the carbon efficiency is fairly constant. That's what this floating pressure will give you. Although the capacity is varied by a factor of four, almost a factor of three, our carbon doesn't change as much. That's what the floating pressure is going to give us. And now we'll go into the operation of the existing. How did we use this floating pressure theory? I know there's a lot more in the books as you go through, but in the interest of time, I thought there are probably more interest towards how do we operate various things. So okay. Like we said, general helium refrigerators are designed to operate at maximum capacity operating point. That's how traditional, if you go anywhere else beyond JLab or JLab and then what projects like SNS, MSU, beyond that, if you go anywhere else on a PNL, these are the plants we modified or we were involved in design. They all operate on the same as JLab floating pressure. But if you go anywhere else, for them, it's one point. It will be what the TSA is. 
and uh, they might ask maybe another one or two operating points as a liquefier, as a refrigerator, and then they re-adjust all the set points to the other mode. So they go between the set points to mode to mode to reposition the plant. At JLab, we don't do anything. It goes from full liquefied to full refrigerated to 100% to 40% in any mode automatically. ESR sees it day in and day out, every day. And we don't come and mess around with it. We don't even care to pay attention to it because it can take care of itself from liquefied to refrigerator to 40% to 100% capacity at the peak efficiency by itself. And that's what SNS does, MSU, the plant, existing plant does. Brookhaven does, and that's what we're going to show how we got there. And the reason is, the capacity, like we said, is we don't know when we are specifying originally when we are designing what the load is going to be, what the system components are going to do. These are our guesses and our best estimates. So we need, and there is no need. I mean, originally when we didn't understand, we used to think, yeah, that's the only way we can design. But as we understand now, we have no need to fix all these as the operating points. We need to understand enough to fix the basic components and, the, and their position to make sure they can cover the map we are looking for. That's what we did in Function. We went from 4K, 2.5 kilowatts to 2K, 4.6 kilowatts to any in between a factor of more than three at a constant efficiency. I mean, that is, if you guys asked any of us 15 years ago, we said, forget it. You guys are just dreaming something. <laughs> but we do it now as a matter of routine. And that's what this. Uh... So, as an optimization, we need to make sure. We are, I mean, the goals of your things are always in mind that uh, uh, control, I mean, uh, what are your optimization goals? How do you want to follow? You should not forget that. So the, the design PS diagram parameters, the present loads, same, you, you, you want to make sure, never forget those questions. What is your optimization goals? So any modifications to the system, present load operating conditions correct. So these, you want to keep this in mind every time you do this. So normally PS are designed at maximum capacity. Many systems are unnecessarily constrained, basically. This is, this is like uh, the analogy we give is like your car. What, what they used to give it is put the gas get pedal to the metal and control your speed with the brake. You can do that. And that's how the systems were sold. I mean, we, we always said the compressors will run. Whatever the load you got, whatever the speed you are going on the road, your, your uh, uh, input is fixed. Your gas is fully, I mean, your pedal is to the floor. Actually, there was no pedal. It was taken away. So you just given the brake. So, operating plants can avoid uh, By, by basically by coming up with this uh, adjustable charge, you can take that uh, constraint away. Are now basically adjustable charges your gas pedal. That's how you're adjusting the gas. I mean, adjusting the gas in the helium system or adjusting the gas in your car. They basically, the more gas you give, the pressure will raise. It will produce more capacity, or, like your car will go at a higher speed. So you don't. That's basically what this floating pressure will give you is that you're able to adjust the charge to meet your needs. Uh, the design PS, uh, I mean, existence is limited to use, often misled. I mean, what it said is, the closer to the TS diagram, people are led to believe we are close to the optimum. And that is not the case. And that's what what we want to communicate is, you want to make sure your controls are only for safety's sake and not for controlling the process. 
the process can exist if you allow it to flow to the ideal by itself. That's all the nature does. I mean, any of the things, if you have a high wind, things will go the high wind direction. They don't go the opposite way. Unless you turn the sail, you try to steer it the other way, you let it go with the nature. It will go automatically there. Don't come in its way unless you have a need for it. And that's what we did not allow because we were afraid by allowing it to float the turbine may get cold and going to shut down. So we constrained everything right around the piercing. There was no, I mean, our assumption was there was no need for these people to take it anywhere else. So we said, let's nail it so it is safe. A variable basically we look at. So this, this is the yes I and already said enough times what we did here is uh, this was a machine built for SCAR experiment and uh, for, uh, went to Berkeley. We brought it here in '93 and we dropped the shell a few times and made a lot of changes. We added some heads to it. And original gas management was has two modes, two or three three modes to go as a uh, as a pure uh, I mean as a refrigerator and as a 20k shield load. And, uh, yeah, actually those are the modes. But now we use as a floating uh, pressure. We, we do not press. We allow this plant to operate at 18 atmosphere all the time unless I would ask for it. So that made this plant to be very reliable. Now it operates almost like 99% availability. Except last year we had more top end failures than ever. And CHL was, this was running at 20.2 atmosphere to charge. And, uh, and when we brought it back, down to now we run as well as 17 and we get the uh, we reduce the power input by more than a megawatt yeah, almost a megawatt, uh, two megawatts now and uh, then also uh, we modified the 2k cold box that, in, that improved the capacity by 10 percent by eliminating a lot of uh, constraints within the cold box of one is we made the heat exchange bigger. We <coughs> reduced the deep coupling between the cold compressors and made it very stable. And uh, uh, I mean, there's a gap of return on all of this. And that added another, I mean, that improved the capacity by more than 500 watts of decay, like 10%. And uh, so that's when we modified the other plant. So that brought, this is where we used to be, 6 plus megawatts. Then after we did the floating pressure, we dropped it to 5.2 like that. Then, as we learned more, when we installed the standby compressor, and we were able to use that even at 5 GeV. We are at 4.2 4 megawatts of six, and this is where we were from 206 on, and that is the amount of power. That's two megawatts is like a million dollar a year power savings to the lab just in the. Otherwise, it would have gone to the cooling tower. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have done any more use more. And also, would have would have paid a lot more in maintenance because we would have been running at the 20.2 atmosphere the charge, and our maintenance was uh, enormous though that time. Yeah. So I got a question. What did your cargo go from? What's that? What did the cargo efficiency go from when you were at 6 megawatts and what do you where you are now? Proportional. Because the load is the, load is the same. So it's proportionally increased from 6 to, I mean, 6 divided by 4.2 times whatever the karma it was. It was like 12 or something there. Probably it came to 16. About 16 now? Yeah. Okay, what, what limits how far you can go with the current? Ours system? will be 20 for the CHL2. Yeah. That's the okay. components. CHL2, in our mind, is the ultimate of what we can do with karma. At 20. What's that? At 20? 20%? Yeah. That's where, because of the limitations of, we got cold compress already done. Those, those cuts are given. We can't change them. They're around 68% efficient, less than 70. So is the, are the cold compressors limited both on the existing plant and the future plant? 
They will help. They will help them improve the car norm if we improve the coal compressor efficiency. Yes. Okay, but that's the problem. Right? That's one of them. I mean, that's not the only one. Existing, the other ones uh, at the C CHL2 is basically the uh, compressors have, we, we do not have compressors can go above 55% car efficiency. I mean, isothermal efficiency today. Unless we push the compressors to the next level, that's where PhD, PhD profit is, and that's where we are. We think the next big two has to come from the compressor. So you because we are throwing away, at uh, the start itself, half the availability at the compressor level. Do you think the biggest hole in the tent right now is the warm compressor? Warm compressor. That is the, by, by far the uh, next contribution. And this is the Bureau of Mines uh, plant. We worked in the 70s, early 80s. Uh, it used to be the plant recovering the, uh, I mean, uh, helium from the uh, at the mines in uh, Amarillo, and we used to supply the helium for the NASA and all the government uh, institutions. In 96, uh, they decommissioned the helium conservation. So we brought that. We upgraded at our test lab here to what they need at the MSEO. We, we put that on the same floating pressure. They vary their the child pressure anywhere from 13 to 18 like we do at ESO. Their capacity varies and it takes care of it automatically. Then this is the SNS plant we built. And uh, basically some other things so what happened is uh, we still copied uh, one of those things, you know, do like what we did at CHO. Some other things went through. Those things we didn't catch in time to fix it. So what had happened is uh, we had a cold box, which is designed just like CHO one, where it, it is a reasonable uh, 2K box, liquefier, but it is not as good a 4K refrigerator. The reason why I'm bringing it up is at the beginning of SNS commissioning, they were running at 4K. They really wanted the, the uh, 7 or 8 kilowatts at 4K, which this plant would have produced with the capacity we have if we took care of very small, like a couple of lost heat exchanger, which would have been probably not even 0.5% of the cost of the plant. And even the pipes went from the banners to those heat exchangers were not looked closely. And those straws limited the whole plant hmm. instead of 7 kilowatts, 8 kilowatts of 4K to 3.5 kilowatts. And it gives me like, I mean, I think about it every day. How, and, but, hey, these things happen. And a lot of people won't talk about it because, I mean, I want to bring it up and tell you because how much thing you have to pay attention to. Because all those six modes what we specified at CHL2, were not specified. They specified as like CHL1 because it was written by same people, I mean, over and control was still that that's how it went because they never understood all the things need to be addressed in those things. So the importance of making it a flat instead of our CHL1 and SNS was like this. And by making, that means they are poor refrigerators but good liquefiers. And they are, if it is like this, means they are good liquefiers and I mean good refrigerator like ESR. But you should design it flat so that they are good refrigerators and look good liquefiers like all the modes we addressed in CHR2. So it can go from one end to the other end, liquefier to refrigerator, and but low capacity to high capacity in a very efficient way. And it does most of the things except for that 4K, but other things it, we, we followed the floating pressure and everything. It has all those parameters built in. <coughs> so, and by originally, by running at uh, what the manufacturer wanted, we were drawing 3.8 megawatts. And we turned it down to floating pressure into the load they wanted, we are running at 2 watts. It's less than a megawatt. Megawatts means a half a million a year. I mean, it's not, the money is not slazing amount of money. It's just, it pays few people's stuff. And also the environmental effect. How much coal it takes to produce that megawatt, and what is the impact there's nothing to gain by spending the megawatt extra. Are they able to do anymore? No, they're still doing all they want to do at 2.7 megawatts. So it came without giving up anything. And 
Next is the here now. This is probably one of the ones took the most advantage of our technology. We are now, I mean, when they had the power outage in uh, 03 in New York, I guess DOE kind of had an interest and then uh, they looked at it and said uh, they need uh, somebody to review how much power it needs to draw and all that. This refrigerator actually, our company built CTI, uh, Helix, way back in the early 80s. Uh, and uh, it was built for Isabel project. Project got cancelled and then it became brick. Brick load was only one third of its cost. And it was the largest machine ever built. It was it has a 15 megawatts of compressor on it. And uh, it has five core boxes each with the about 35 foot long. And uh, so when they went from one third load, they brought the 15 megawatts to 9.4 megawatts. And they said, oh, it took them 10 years to get there, and they were happy to run at 9.4. And they said, yeah, we are doing everything we could. And uh, then they came to us to say, OK, do we send them here to see what can be done? So when we went and looked at it, we said, uh, it looks like we can do something. I mean, but their, their rationale was, oh, we already did. Everything possible, we are running at it, it's all optimized. There's nothing more to save. Just we'd like you to save why waste time like now. But we didn't buy into it. Basically, we said, okay, we'll come on a weekend, we'll do uh, what the minimum we don't do any changes to hardware. We'll change how the plant operates. If it doesn't operate like what, what you think, we'll put it back. You will have two days loss of your maybe on your maintenance day when you don't have the people who are willing to come. And that's what happened. We went on a weekend, we did that, and it dropped. Basically, changed it to protein pressure from fixed pressure to pressure. And no zero investment except they bought out two tickets for me and Pete. And uh, we dropped two megawatts that day. At Long Island, it's not four cents a kilo. And they were rewriting their negotiations. And that's when some of the arguments I gave you, they said, oh, put it back. Uh, we have to retrain our operators. I mean, it's going to cut, cut into our availability. Our answer is, you don't need operators. At JLF, we don't have operators. We're on, on top. <laughs> we don't have full-time operators, and you don't need it. <laughs> so the, some of them were good for some people, or harsh for some people. But given aside, they started moving ahead because it's too big an impact not to take action. Politically, it wouldn't help really <laughs> moved too far. So we did it on three phases to fit in the beam time. And we told them, first two megawatts is free. We have no hardware change or anything. Next one, if you invest it, you can gain. So they asked us how much. And we said, you have to, invest, you have to put another thermostat in it. You are missing a thermostat. So we said, we will design the core box. And it was like one, one and a half million or 1.2 million somewhere. But we said we'll reduce some more. We our goal was to take it to 5.4 megawatts is what we said. This is where we started. In each phase we tried. Now they are running at 4.8 megawatts. They are doing exactly the same experiments. This is where they were. They believed they optimized everything they can. I mean everybody believed we are running it like that. There's nothing more to say. And they're doing every experiment they were doing even here, 4.8 megawatts. And their reliability is a lot higher because they're not pushing the plant. They have a lot more spare equipment there in case something goes wrong. So next comes the NASA. They, are, they had Lindy supplied cold boxes in the 90s uh, to do the Cryopanel testing, 20K outer space simulation in the airspace. So they wanted the 0.25 Kelvin stability in the plant. And they couldn't get it. The temperature was varying 2.5 Kelvin up and down. So then now they want to build a Hubble telescope. And for this Hubble telescope, it's not like the uh, last one where we can you know, shuttle and go and fix the lenses and all. So this is the 1 million mile orbit. <coughs> Once it's fired, it's fired forever. It's nobody's going to do anything. So they want to test everything possible 
as close to the conditions here. So by checking around, they came to JLab, and because they heard about the floating pressure, and so first thing they asked is, hey, we are messing around with our existing plan. What can you do? So we took their existing plan to make a floating pressure. But this is where their operate is around 40, 50 percent. So this is watt per watt. They're, they're normally running around 200 watt per watt. So by making it floating pressure, they're operating around 140 <coughs> watt per watt. It's constant efficiency, all the way up to 60 percent. It was not designed far enough, so, but now for this, I mean, for this uh, uh, James Webb, where we are help, we help them design this new plant where it can go almost constant efficiency from 100 to 30 percent. And the load can vary anywhere from, I mean, this design probably the most uh, optimistic plant built in this range to go from 2 kilowatt to 100 kilowatt and also range from 10k to 100k. And at a very constant carbon efficiency. And it's in the process of commissioning right now. And this is probably is going to set us the new standards in this class of machines. And then they used to tell us, oh, we are designing these plants. Uh, once we know one plant, and that's where we need to. They have two, three and a half kilowatt plants. This is where I was telling you, all plants don't have the same tolerance as when you build. So the optimums are not the same. So although they both form, are mass produced plants, but the compressors, turbines, heat exchangers have a different tolerances when they put together the plant. So one has a different optimization than the other. So by allowing to floating pressure, they can still don't have to use the same numbers from one and use the more. So by allowing it to relax it and let it float, it seeks its own optimum. So although the plants are designed to one design, by allowing it to float, even the variations in the tolerances in the manufacturing or mess ups or screw ups in the processes, can automatically adjust and reach its own maximum where, where it can go to. It may not be the best, but at least it will go to the best it can go to. So these are the things what we accomplished now. We were able to, with a constant efficiency, we were able to get the stability and uh, provide. So what's common in all this is variable pressure of operation in all this. So the bottom line is like this. When we optimize it, and see this is what uh, from the my cultural background, they used to tell me, no? don't be a, uh, send five people, blind people in their room where the high elephant is standing, and tell them to describe what is an optimum. So, each one holds one thing and oh, the elephant looks like this. The elephant looks. Like, see, everybody is looking what he's feeling, but uh, nobody is seeing what the thought is. So, in looking at an optimum system, so if you ask, no, like project management, call job, they will tell you, oh, minimize my cost. That's, they will worry the rest later. So, if you ask the user, they say, I want the max capacity. I don't care where you are. So, the cold box case says, oh, I'm going to optimize my cold box. The compressor case says, I'm going to. Optimize. So the operator, oh, I need to minimize man, my operations and efficiency, and I need to rest, report on this. So everybody have different goals. They're not exclusive of each other. They're all inclusive and depends upon how wide you open your freedom at the start of the world. That's all I got. Questions? Okay. What year? Um, when did you develop the? I started at SSCL 92, 91 when I became a user. I used I was a vendor before that. My career started at CDI as a selling. I used to go there, sell the machine, set it up like four walls to your CDI. They wanted 550 watts, and we had trouble. Reviewed it up to 750, collected my check, went home, and never bothered where it operated. See, as a vendor, all our goal was to run it where we promised and go home and never look back. When I became a user, my needs were different there, and I need to pay for all these things. And also, I have different things I can't define up front, what the test program needs. So those are the things forced to go into this. Is there, is there Uh, 
that's at the max capacity. If yeah, everything comes, if every, your loads are as you predicted in the Linux, and every component design, you get changes, everything. It is like hitting the dot on a white thing and saying, I'm going to hit the dot each time. That's when you run on the PS. It's, it's in practical systems, it's never. Because nothing, 100%, nothing happens exactly. Every turbine, every heat exchange, every compressor will not come what you wish. It's not possible. So, so what, what specifically do you do to make the, this run on this variable? It's the amount of charge. Like so you cha change the amount of okay. charge of the helium in the system. Yeah. And by start, the, start the compressors if they need. What we look at in Yasari, we look at, say, we maintain the liquid level and the dover safe between 50 and 60 percent. We say the discharge pressure can come down to uh, 13 atmospheres, below which the oil removal gets into trouble. And that's when the, already the dover is at 60 percent level. That means I am at the minimum. And if my dover level hit 50 or 10 percent, I want to be at 18 atmospheres. So we program the gas management to look at the dover. So if the door is low, that means I have to increase my discharge pressure. If the door is filling up, I have too much capacity to reduce it. So gas management looks at it, and whereas at the NASA, it looks at the return temperature. If my return temperature, I want to control at 20 Kelvin, if it's coming at 19 and a half, it takes mass out of the system. If it's going at around 20.5, it adds mass to the system. So it's like your gas pedal, just like your car. We, but that was not the case in the past. If the charge was fixed, by fixing the pressures. Yeah. Did you also say helium with this? What's that? Did you also say about helium? No. Helium charge. Helium losses are irrelevant. Irrelevant. I mean, not related to this. Is this uh, does this apply to regular refrigerators or uh, systems that are in use all over the country? No, because that has a your regular helium refrigerator. I mean, your home refrigerator or air conditioner. The discharge pressure is dictated by the environment or the outside temperature. Here, the discharge pressure we can vary. When outside gets hot, it goes, the pressure goes up on the condenser. Or the cooling water you are using, they set the pressure. They, that, that is a different cycle. That's called vapor compression cycle. These are uh, the, the, these are clocks. These are different cycles. The cycle itself is different to utilize this technology. Anybody else? Yeah. Talk a lot about power savings. What about liquid nitrogen consumption? Liquid nitrogen consumption is directly proportional to the heat exchange size, HX1 going from 300 to 80K. And that trade off is how much capital you want to invest versus uh, how much nitrogen. And that's how we look at it to see what is the optimum uh, when we optimize the nitrogen. We'll, we'll address that next week. I'll show you where you come up with the turbines to replace that altogether. That's the next class. Related, yeah, okay, class ahead. related to this this uh, class, then, does the pressure as the uh, discharge pressure variation uh, affect the liquid nitrogen, improve the liquid nitrogen usage in brown plants? No. Liquid nitrogen is independent of the pressure. It basically depends on the mass flow going through the system and the more liquefied refrigerator. You did that briefly, but you didn't really explain the thing about the turbines getting cold and also about the turbine speed. Did you? Highlight or just briefly touch on that? Okay. Yeah. That See, one of the misnomers at JLab when I got here is the turbine speed controls the capacity. Turbine speed here, if, uh, turbine, actually for these turbines, the speed is independent of its capacity. They should be running at the full speed if you can vary the brake. At CHL, the brake was fixed, so we were indirectly controlling by controlling the inlet pressure to the turbine. So the speed was coming down because the brake is fixed as we reduce the inlet pressure. So if the brake was a variable like ESR, where the turbine brake, it just as the amount of output varies, the turbine will always run at one speed. And with respect to the temperature, the turbines have a very wide operating range from temperature. They start, say for example, 300K where there's no liquid nitrogen, they cool down from 300K down to the cooling level, and they operate the whole entire range. But if you look at how the controls were programmed originally at CHL, what to operate within those windows, and those are the things we took it out. Did it answer it? Yeah. Rao, could you explain the uh, 
dependence of uh, turbine speed to efficiency? What's that? Can you explain the correspondence of turbine speed to efficiency? Yeah. The helium, um, because uh, specific heat is so high, uh, uh, the tip speed uh, for efficient appliance need to be very high. So what we do, uh, in the, because of the material limitation, we can go to say uh, 1200, uh, nowadays I guess they are going up to 2000 uh, feet per second on the tip speed of the turbines. And you want to design so that they are always running at the max tip speed irrespective of uh, where you are with respect to uh, your uh, pressure. So that's where you adjust your brake so it's running close to its maximum. Because the maximum, uh, ideal, ideal efficiency will be even higher than the 2000 feet per second. But that's what the materials we have will allow. So, for example, in Lindley type, salsa type turbines, where we always set the brake to run at the maximum possible speed to get the most possible efficiency. Whereas at CHR, because the brake is fixed, we can, it automatically, because it always applies the fixed amount of brake. So if we reduce the output, it slows down. It's an unfortunate thing, because we cannot change it, because they are built into the casing, uh, the brake orifices. We can't change it. So the efficiency to be have the maximum efficiency, the turbines have to run at the max max speed possible, and the the limit is the material mark the process. I don't think I answered it. You did. Uh, oh. Why did they uh, design turbines then with a fixed speed? I mean, not a, a, a fixed brake. Fixed brake is designed so that uh, they are mostly used for the air separation plants where they always run at the max production and they always run at the maximum case where they have no need to reduce it. One more variable thing is less, uh, uh, can cause more uh, uh, maintenance. So they, what the air liquid or even some of the other golden days, they said is minimize the moving parts. So instead of not having another valve controlling the brake is one less component. So they said, because they want, always want to max, produce the maximum, it can produce it. They never envision where the capacity need to be reduced up very, so their vision was max capacity. That's that's where the fixed brake was originally started. Well, uh, yeah. I just want to add one more comment. You made the, uh, uh, the, the uh, gain in, in power uh, consumption for PNN plant. Uh -huh. In my opinion, the biggest gain also is, is due to the reliability increase. I mean, uh, although we could not uh, yeah. evaluate it exactly, but uh, based on my experience running with that, I think uh, we gain more money even than, than, than the power. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, they save a lot and, of and, money by and that's, and that's just by leaving the plant alone. I used to struggle with the technicians. Hey, don't change the set points. Don't fight the plant. Let it go. Let it go. And that has gained a lot of... Uh, we used to, I mean, is to crack, crash a turbine every yeah. week. I know, I know. <laughs> and, and that $60, uh, $60,000 uh, to rebuild it. So I just wanted yeah. to make that. No, no, I mean, like, even for us, the compressors, the amount of compressor maintenance we used to do in the 94 when we started, versus what we do now, 74,000. I mean, even if you ask the compressor manufacturer, they says, huh, how do you do that? Even air products who came here, and want to take over the operations of the cryo system. After seeing all this, they said, no, there's nothing we can contribute to you. So. Any other questions? I have one. Yeah. One. I did do my homework for this one. Uh -huh. What chapters should I read ahead for the next one? What chapters might we want to read ahead if we have a chance? The liquid nitrogen. Liquid and, nitrogen. Yeah, I mean, basically, we want to go over uh, and the components, how, how, what are the components available for this? in this business and where they came from, what, what do they okay. do. And also, what is the trade-off? When do we use liquid nitrogen? When, we, when it is uh, good and when, what advantages and disadvantages? That's what we do. Great. Stanker speaker, one more. Oh, do we have one more question? No? Stanker speaker. We'll see you next time.